NASA needs a marketing specialist, and you are the best. The Mustang Fastback, 355 horses for him, seat belts for the family. I'm just lucky that my water didn't break in there. Hi, Ron. Two years ago on my second video ever on this channel, I reviewed a movie which I thought marked the beginning of the end of the dark age of cinema. We were finally seeing the light at the end of the progressive tunnel with Top Gun Maverick. Ever since, we've gotten a whole slew of movies that focused on telling a fun and engaging story with good character development. And that continues to be the case with Fly Me to the Moon, a movie about our voyage to the moon. But exactly what makes Fly Me to the Moon a great movie? And will it do well at the box office? Join me, dear viewer, as I dive back into the smoldering cesspool that is modern Hollywood. Before we get into this, make sure to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel out with continuing to grow and it's totally free. I do have to get one thing off my chest and be completely honest with you, dear viewers. I confess that I am a massive space nerd. What gave it away? As if you couldn't tell from my background here. Now, I'm not old enough to have been alive to watch any of the moon landings, unfortunately. But I have gotten a chance to dive very deep into the history of the space program and I enjoy pretty much everything I can find in the topic. When I lived in Texas, I got to go to the NASA Museum in Houston, where I was absolutely enthralled at all we had achieved. On the tour, stepping into the original Mission Control Center gave me the chills. So much history in such a small room. What was even better was having been able to see the current NASA Mission Control, and it was just so dope. So imagine my surprise during AMC's Mystery Movie Night when Fly Me to the Moon began to play. I had seen the trailer some months ago and did make a mental note to go check this movie out as it had elicited a blast from the past feeling with its look and style. The movie stars Channing Tatum as Mission Director Cole Davis, a former NASA pilot who is tasked with making every preparation for the Apollo 11 moon landing. Although with everything going on in Vietnam, public support of the Apollo program had begun to wane by then. So both in the movie and in real life, NASA went about drumming up public support by advertising the mission several different ways. For cinematic structure, the movie uses Scarlett Johansson's character of Kelly Jones as the female version of Don Draper to push the Apollo mission forward. Advertising is based on one thing happiness. So Jones ingeniously begins to market everyday products with a space-based twist. One such very fun and accurate callback was of the astronauts all wearing Omega watches. Now for anyone who doesn't know, Omega makes some of the world's most beautiful watches. Omega is to watches what Aston Martin is to cars. Pure class all the way. And that's how they wanted to portray the astronauts as the best of humanity going off into the stars. Kelly Jones's strategy begins to pay off in droves as the mission's popularity begins to skyrocket. And the closer the US got to launch date, the more nervous they became that it may not actually work. So a shadowy government official named Mo Burkus, played by Woody Harrelson, approached Kelly Jones with an alternate plan, one that would see them stage a fake moon landing in case the real thing didn't go through as planned. The jury is still out on whether the government truly did have that kind of contingency plan. But one thing is for sure, we really did land on the moon. Let me take a moment to debunk the moon landing deniers here and now. Prior to Apollo 11, there were 10 other missions that tested every single aspect of the final mission, including Apollo 10. What Apollo 10 did was to act as a dress rehearsal for the actual moon landing. See, getting to the moon required years of theorizing. The difficult part isn't getting to the moon, it's how to enter lunar orbit, deploy a lander, land it safely, then relaunch it back into lunar orbit, and redock it with its mothership. That was the whole point of Apollo 10, to test lunar orbit insertion. 50 years later, we're actually still using the exact same technique we developed for the Apollo program with the Artemis missions that aim to land humans back on the moon in 2025. Artemis 1 was already a resounding success. 
autonomously testing the lunar orbit insertion. Artemis 2 will act as a precursor mission, flying humans around the moon much in the same way that Apollo 10 did back in 1969. All in preparation for Artemis 3 to put the first woman on the moon in late 2025. Another more logical reason to debunk the moon landing deniers is the fact that 40,000 people worked together to put a human on the moon. Does anyone really think that 40,000 people can shut their mouths up about a secret that big? The reason the film cites for faking the moon landing was to bankrupt the Soviets. That part is actually partially true, except it didn't happen for another 10 years. Bankrupting the Soviet Union was the neoconservative strategy spearheaded by Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. But he didn't do it with lunar missions. He did it through something a lot more earthly. Debt. The explosion of financial debt instruments such as mortgage-backed securities in the 80s eventually led to bankrupting the Soviet Union. We outspent them to win, and we all put it on Uncle Sam's credit card. Oh, and let's not forget that this strategy also led to the global financial crisis in 2008, but I digress. Getting back to the movie Fly Me to the Moon, I can say it's pretty historically accurate. However, it does fictionalize certain elements, such as the character of Kelly Jones. It also fictionalizes some of the conspiracy theories surrounding the moon landing. In the film, we get a rising director who's been relegated to filming commercials to stage the fake moon landing. In reality, the rumor goes that the government employed none other than Stanley Kubrick himself in order to achieve this task. And the film makes mention of Kubrick's involvement in a jab that sort of broke the fourth wall. One thing the film did extremely well was to pay homage to those lost to the cause of landing a man on the moon. The astronauts that died on the launch pad for Apollo 1 take center stage in Cole Davis' life. They are the driver for his dedication to the mission. He puts everything he has into Apollo 11 because he wants to honor their memories and because he can't be up there himself due to an underlying heart condition. The film shows his utter dedication to the cause, which in and of itself is very patriotic but not in that annoying America rah 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 jingoism sort of way. It's deeper than that. The film depicts a country that was deeply divided, but one which unites for a common cause. Generally, the history of the United States is filled with such moments. Kennedy being shot and killed, but the country uniting behind the Apollo mission is just one example. Another prime example that happened during many of our lives was that of 9-11, when the country united in a way not seen since the Apollo missions. Although I won't get into the disaster that was our adventures in delivering democracy to the desert. Save that for another video. Suffice it to say that Fly Me to the Moon's portrayal of patriotism was agnostic of country origin, and that was a huge part of its charm. It didn't focus so much on American achievement, but rather humanity's achievements. The film's feel was a lot more hopeful than many of the movies we've seen lately. It showed what humanity can be capable of if we just work together. And the acting is what brings that home for the viewer. The chemistry between Channing Tatum and Scarlett Johansson is undeniable. The two characters play a sort of flirtatious game of volleyball, playfully dishing out humorous jab after humorous jab at one another. It's that playful banter that brings the characters closer together. Come to think of it, this is not so much a drama as it is a romantic comedy. The structure of this film seems to line up very well with a lot of rom-com tropes. The meet cute, opposites attracting, enemies to lovers, the external challenge, the grand gesture, secret identities, and workplace romance. The beginning sees an opposites attract angle with a dash of push-pull that often comes with antagonistic dynamics in the beginnings of relationships. When the truth comes out about what Kelly Jones has done, it presents a challenge to the relationship between her and Cole. But through working together to overcome the antagonistic Mo, played by Woody Harrelson, the pair is brought closer together by the end. Part of what makes this film a feel-good movie is its charm, and it's the charm delivered by the brilliant chemistry between the two leads that brings it together rather well. The other part of the charm in the movie is its country-agnostic patriotism. 
it portrays a love of country and togetherness that we really don't see much of anymore. It shows the glory days gone by. But I think there's a much deeper theme here that if you explore the history of Hollywood, you'll see what I mean. Remember 1998? We got two movies about asteroids and Deep Impact and Armageddon. These are what are called twin films. Also in 1998, for example, we got Ants and A Bug's Life. Later on in 2000, we got Red Planet and Mission to Mars. What twin films usually signify is what the collective zeitgeist is thinking about at the time. Back in the late 90s, we went through a scare of an asteroid impact. After the Mars rover landing, the collective vision of the country looked toward Mars as the next frontier, hence the two movies of humans traveling there. When I was watching Fly Me to the Moon, I got that same feeling of tapping into the current cultural zeitgeist. So much so, that the movie felt a little bit like propaganda for the Artemis missions to me. Much like in the film, not many people today care or even know about the Artemis missions. I mean, hell, we're sending humans back to the moon for Pete's sake! I may be an elder millennial, but I sure as hell wasn't alive when we did have humans on the moon, and I'd love to see it happen in my life. Boomers got to experience the original moon landing, and now it's the turn of millennials and Gen Z to experience what our parents had back on July 20th of 1969. And that's what made this movie feel so good to me. It felt like a passing of the torch from boomers to millennials, which is a real thing that's going on right now. The largest transfer of wealth in history is on the cusp of happening as the boomers begin to die off over the coming years. So this film serves as just that passing of the torch in my eyes. If only our leaders and presidents sound more like this. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And less like this. This guy, oh, I don't know what I said, ah. Oh. We finally beat Medicare. Then maybe we can get back to that level of patriotism, hope, and togetherness that was portrayed so well in the film. Should you go see this movie in theaters? Yes, absolutely. Hollywood has been churning out garbage for the past 10 to 15 years, and we have to vote with our wallets. Much like the bike riders, which I also reviewed, Fly Me to the Moon deserves the theater treatment. So get out there and watch this film. But what do you guys think about all this? Did you enjoy Fly Me to the Moon? And what did you think of its portrayal of the real history behind the Apollo 11 mission? Please do let me know down below in the comments. And as always, hit that like button, ring that notification bell, and smash that subscribe button, and I'll see you in the next one. Or perhaps we've just forgotten that we are still pioneers that we've barely begun and that our greatest accomplishments cannot be behind us because our destiny lies above us.